Thank you for your time, everyone. Uh, glad you could attend today. So we're going to go over uh, preventing failure of network or vault transformers. Um, this was something that was kind of uh, came into my view when I was working for the power company. Uh, I, as Randy mentioned, I was at Memphis Light, Gas and Water. Uh, I did close to 28 years there, and we actually had the oldest network uh, in the U.S. Uh, so our network transformers dated back to, uh, that system went back to 1908. Uh, so still paper leg cable. Uh, and we were, as you can imagine, with equipment of that age, we were starting to see a lot of failures. And the, these failures are, are really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're catastrophic. They're huge. And they, and being the location of the equipment, I mean, it's, it's a new story every time. Uh, a lot of damage. Uh, Sometimes we had an instance where some people got hurt. So this was something that's like, okay, I really need to figure out how to stop this. Uh, so I kind of went through everybody in the industry uh, looking at typical monitoring and really couldn't find anything that addressed the failure mode that I was seeing. Uh, overall. So that was when I, I came up with uh, what I'm going to show you today. And, and by all means, this, is, this will not only be uh, concerning network transformers, but gas generation and transformers, um, some different ways of looking at them. Uh, so so I, I, I do, because of what I had to do here, it, it, it led me down the road to looking at a lot of different angles on um, testing and monitoring of, of transformers. So with that being said, we will get into it. So those of you that aren't familiar with them, uh, this is generally what you'll see in a network transformer. Um, it, it, it is, it exists, the reason it exists uh, you have a multiple primaries of feeding. So each transformer will have a single primary feeding in to it, but you may have six of them in a vault under a building. Uh, and these are all tied into a secondary network grid. So now we have this, this, mm -hmm. this, this big redundancy of, you know, if we lose this circuit, we still maintain power. So a lot of your, your larger metropolitan areas will have this type of system. Um, so there's some challenges when you, when you come to looking at these. Uh, first of all, it, it's not that, that expensive a piece of equipment. Uh, average cost, if you're counting this plus a protector, probably around 60 to 100 grand is what we're looking at. Uh, so once you start applying the old 10% rule for monitoring, mm -hmm. Are, are you there, Randy? Yeah, sorry. Somebody uh, had their microphone turned off. Oh, okay. On. I was just making sure you could hear me. I'm sorry. I did, well, I can I hear said, you fine. Yeah, I'll I'm say, sorry. Somebody else had their microphone no, no, turned not, on. Not a I, problem at all. I thought maybe you were trying to tell me that you couldn't hear me. <laughs> but, okay. So back to it. Um, so so that cost thing is – it's really me, like we don't want to put a lot of monitoring on equipment that costs that much. You know, it, it seems like monitoring goes directly to – uh, how much was spent on the equipment to start with, which, which to me has always been kind of a, 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 a the wrong way to look at it. But, you know, uh, when you have your, your budget guys looking at it, uh, I'd prefer to look at it if one of these fails, you know, what's, what's the, the aftermath of that event? Uh, like I said, I've seen customers injured. I've seen buildings catch fire, uh, cars damaged, uh, entire vaults ruined. Um, so, you know, the cost of the equipment is, is really secondary to, to what you're going to deal with uh, if you have a failure. Um, and, and, and that goes across the board, even when you get inside the fence. You know, I, I, I've seen things as simple as a, uh, a, a, a PT failure that would, uh, you know, take out a, a bushing, a transformer. I mean, so, so really any failure or especially when we get into breakers where we start looking at okay this breaker if it's not operating correctly uh we're steadily robbing transformers of life or if we have one totally lock up we can 
you know, fail in one event. So it's always that aftermath that we have to look at. So some of the things you're dealing with with these, this transformer in particular, which, which really led me down an interesting road when you're looking at online monitoring, uh, they're, they're kind of unique. So you, these transformers have three isolated compartments. So they don't share at all and they do not sh share a gas face. Uh, they are nitrogen blanketed for the most part. Um, and so you have a cable compartment which where your primary will come into the transformer. You have a switch compartment, which will let you isolate or ground uh, that transformer. And then you have a main tank, which is where your core and coil assemblies, uh, assembly resides. Um, so another issue about this is these vaults flood a lot. And uh, Memphis, we're inland pretty good. So corrosion and flooding wasn't as big an issue. Um, but, you know, I've had water lines burst. These things go underwater. And they don't have a nitrogen supply system on them. So one of the other things I had to consider was when I was looking at how do I keep these from failing was to understand why they fail. And a lot of times that would be due to moisture ingress of some kind, either due to degradation of gaskets, degradation of the tank. So the protector is on the other end of this. This this really doesn't provide any protection to the primary side of the transformer. Uh, it's, it's it's there more or less to um, put the transformer in service and pull it out of service. So you know if, if if you're looking at this secondary grid and we need some more power on this, that transformer will begin. If we start seeing backfeed through that transformer, the protector automatically takes it out. Um, so again, it, it's really more of a uh, uh, operations kind of uh, kind of device than a protection device for the transformer. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. I, I don't know that protector is really the it's protector for the customer more than the, the equipment. So this is what is typical after one of these failures. Um, again, a, a big problem with them is where it's located. I mean, these are always uh, right in the middle of downtown. And so a good example here in Memphis, uh, Bill Street, for those of you that aren't familiar with Memphis, is sort of a big tourist attraction for us. Uh, I know on Bill Street alone, I had five, at least five small network transformers. Uh, the problem with that being uh, they were on, they were in very small vaults, uh, small enough that you could not walk around transformer to get from primary to secondary side. You actually had to come out of one door on the vault and open up the other end to go in. Uh, and they were very low below street surface. So maybe two feet to the top of the transformer where they sit. Uh, so, you know, this is this is a place where we might have up to. 50,000 tourists wandering around after a Grizzlies game one night. So this kind of always in the back of my mind is like, you know, we really, we don't want to ever see that happen. Uh, you know, I, I kind of the do no harm kind of thing, I guess, for, for utility. I mean, that would be uh, a, a critical misstep to, to, to allow that type of failure. Um, so as I said, serious, serious threat to both property uh, and safety of, of it heavily populated downtown areas. Uh, and then when you have a failure, uh, again, because of where they're located, now we're shutting streets down. Uh, I've seen several in New York. I've seen uh, one in Atlanta that caused the street from hospitals shut down in the last couple of years. So, and again, I'm seeing these on the news here. Uh, so, you know, obviously there's a lot of negative media that's asso associated when one of these fail. You, you have a large explosion and fire in the middle of your downtown. And then it, if failure is severe enough, it's a pretty lengthy and costly, rest costly restoration process. Like I said, you're going to set streets down. There's vaults. You've got to bring cranes in. It's got to be lifted. Um, and if you had a big enough fire, there's also the infrastructure of the vault that has to be dealt with. So generally when we talk about transformer monitoring, we're looking at main tank. That, that's most of the concern. Most of, most of us come from a substation background. So we're thinking uh, main tank is our critical point, uh, bushings, another critical point, and then LTC monitoring, probably the, the third most important point. Uh, with these transformers, the failures I was, I was seeing in, were 
where very rarely were they a main tank failure. Uh, I'll, now, it might result in eventually being a main tank failure, but generally it would start with that cable compartment. So here we see one and you see the door, uh, which got blown off of this one. Big fire. Uh, a lot of times, this, this is why I'd say probably 80, 85% of the time, this is exactly what this failure looked like. Um, and then a lot of times this failure would occur. You blow these bushings out of the bottom of the cable. We ignite the switch. We could ignite the main tank as well uh, during these events. So when you start thinking about how to monitor this, um, you really got to look at access points. Um, so monitoring of the main tank, it, again, not a not a costly piece of equipment so if i place hydrogen monitoring in the main tank now i'll see things like partial discharge you know thermal overload of the main tank cores core and coils however no indication to what's going on inside this cable compartment whatsoever um, so really to effectively do this now i'm looking at monitoring for all three compartments uh, so if we go lowest cost uh, which would be hydrogen monitoring uh, that's several thousands of dollars to do that. And now we've got the second issue, which another reason I've seen a lot of these fail. Uh, often the cable compartment on these, it's not even pressurized. So it's filled with cable. Uh, so I, I actually worked on one one time where they had changed the ingress of the, of the primary cable from the top to elbows in the front, going from a paper lead to a... Uh, elbowed cable in the front of the compartment came back and had welded plates on top never finished welding them so i mean it was it was completely exposed atmosphere luckily it was in a a walk-in a walk-in vault instead of an underground vault where it was getting rained on um so it hadn't taken on that much water at that point but again kind of the point that really no way to confirm uh, rather than having somebody roll out, that 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 integrity of that compartment is good. So you could develop a leak, uh, all the oil drain out. You could be taking on all kinds of water. You see the close proximity of these cables, generally like a 13-2 delta. Uh, so uh, easy flashover event we have right here. For me. Um, so due to the small capacity that we have in these switch compartments, so about eight gallons of oil is what we're looking at, cable oil that we have in these. Uh, when you do have that high energy event in there, there's, there's just nowhere for it to go. Um, we really, you know, there's no kind of fresh PRV on this, nothing like that. Uh, so again, we're going to have it ignite, ignite the, the oil of that, uh, that quick thermal uh, increase. We're going to blow that, blow that door out, blow that tank out. Um, also another thing I ran into, so our general maintenance, we would look at these on an annual uh, or, or, or maybe every two year, if we could get to them, uh, you would go down and generally we would take some TCG readings, uh, which I'll go into here in a minute for those of you that, that aren't as old, old as me and aren't familiar with that test. And we would check pressures. And so a lot of times we would find that the switch compartment and the main tank of these transformers could often be in a vacuum in the wintertime uh, and a great deal of overpressurization during the summer, just ambient changes. Uh, so as you get this push and pull, and, and like I said, we're stalking two or three uh, PSI vacuum up to maybe eight, nine PSI pressure during the summer. Uh, you're just placing a lot of stress on the gasking system of these transformers. You do it, you end up having a you'll end up having leaks before it's over. And again, without a nitrogen supply system like you have on nit nitrogen blanket trans uh, substation transformer, uh, you're going to start taking on wash moisture immediately, especially with the environment that they're in. Uh, as that happens, our dielectrics drop and we do get these flashover events. So existing, what I, what, what, when I went to my vendors, I'm like, guys, need something to look at this. This is what came back to me. We're looking at hydrogen monitoring in the drain valve of the main tank. Um, so again, main tank's not really where I was seeing them fail. And also I've done quite a bit of playing around uh, with how quickly does hydrogen migrate through that oil to drain valves. Uh, 
you know, how, how reliable is that? And again, we've all been doing it a long time and it, it definitely is an effective means of doing it. Uh, but because of the application here, I kind of had to go a different route. Uh, so when you're at that main dra that drain valve, you're really measuring from a static point. So any of you that have ever pulled a sample uh, substation transformer, uh, I've had to sit there and gain two, drain two or three gallons of water off of before. Uh, so that would be where you're taking your measurements. Again, it's, it's a convenient place for it. And uh, the most typical place you'll see it done. However, maybe not the most effective place. And, and we'll dig into that in a second. Uh, monitoring of protector relays. So we're looking at the, the, the relays from the network protector. This gives us an idea of what's our voltage, what's our load, what's the status, is this, is this protector in, you know, transform in or out of uh, uh, the grid right now. Uh, some people would even bring in maybe a transformer oil temperature, you know, top oil, we're getting that in and take a look at it. Um, which are, which are all critical things to know about your transformer. However, these are really operational values. So uh, I, I, can, I can't really remember a lot of events where Topple would have tipped me off that I was going to have a failure or, or, top, or you know, a load or a change in something. Uh, generally, when you want to get into that, we, we've got to really look at uh, hydrogen generation, uh, DGA, what kind of gassing patterns are we seeing? Uh, partial discharge is a great indicator. So, so while these values are important, they're not really going to give you any indication that, hey, you've got a failure that's going to happen in the next week if you don't get down here and address this. And then finally, uh, the cable compartments are not pressurized. So again, I don't know if this thing's leaked all the oil out. Uh, which I have been into vaults where the, the vault floor was full of oil uh, that had run out of it, uh, maybe has filled up with water. There's just no way, no way to know. Uh, you know, I've seen, I've been in utilities where they've actually put pressure transducers on these tanks or, or on this compartment. Uh, however, the problem being, if you have a sealed compartment that's not pressurized, where's that alarm point? I mean, we're, we're saying, you know, zero would be expected at that point or some, some slight variance either side of it. Uh, so a leak, all the oil runs out, that's just a atmosphere. Uh, so now we, we really, even with, a, with some type of pressure indication, we still don't know we have a problem remotely. Uh, so this is kind of what I, what I came up with. I, I made a few changes, and I'm not going to rant on the product a lot. Um, I have got these in service. I, I put in a polycarbonate enclosure because of the submersibility and the corrosive effects of, of salt water that a lot of these see. Um, these adapters have been made into a, uh, a silica bronze. The stainless was a bit difficult to work with, so that's been changed. Probably need to update this a bit. Uh, but the main thing, this monitor is actually mounted on top of the transformer. Uh, so... We don't have guys standing on it to do work, uh, less chance of damage. Uh, and then these adapters are, are mounted into existing ports of the transformer, sample ports, uh, which are used to take, take samples of gas space, essentially is what I've done. Uh, so again, just kind of gotten it up off the floor. I've gotten it out of the way and uh, less chance that I'm, I'm going to actually put it underwater and also a highly submersible enclosure for this. Um, so TCG testing, this was, this was a great tool when I was at the utility that uh, uh, kind of has gone by the wayside. Uh, I know the, the filaments that go in these, I, I don't, I'm not even sure you can get them th th that much anymore, but this was something that we did for a long time. Uh, so TCG, te TCG test consisted of hooking to the gas sample valve on the transformer, be it substation, distribution, network, uh, whatever we happen to look at, line regulator, anything, uh, and you take a reading. Now, it doesn't really give you an indication like a DGA. It's going to tell you, you know, how much of these combustible gases, hydrogen, methane, ethane, have I got present. What it does is it, 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 it reads a small filament, and the amperage of that will change as combustible gases are present. 
So we're just looking at a static number uh, to determine, hey, we have elevated combustible gas on this transformer. And it, it was a useful tool. I mean, it's a, it's a quick reading, uh, very, very fast to perform in the field. And again, we, we caught a lot of problems with these. Um, so this was kind of where my thinking started going when I was trying to consider how do I want to look at these? Uh, and I kind of went back to this test. Um, so this is actually an old McGraw Edison tester that we're looking at. So I designed a pump and manifold system uh, that again, these adapters can be mounted into each of these compartments and it allows me to circulate, self-circulate gas phase without exposing anything to atmosphere ever. Um, so that, that, and then I, I put a hydrogen sensor in line with that and also a pressure transducer. So this, this had a lot of benefit. Again, we're looking at hydrogen monitoring was what I went to as it's by far the most cost effective. And really, it, it's really only a smoke detector anyway. It's gonna tell you that something is going on, not necessarily what it is or where it is. And that was really all I needed for these was to know that, hey, I'm starting to see some PD. I'm starting to see some overheating something that's going to result in the failure. So with that cable breakdown, for instance, in the, in the cable compartment, that would be the primary indicator that that failure was about to happen was hydrogen production due to PD. Uh, so I would take all these compartments, combine them into a single line, and I'm pretty much sampling everything all at once with a single, single hydrogen chip uh, looking at it. And it's allowed, so if anything occurs to any of these compartments, I'll see it immediately. Uh, and, I, and I base that a lot on the rate of change. And I, 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 di I did a, part, uh, a paper a while back, an article a while back. I don't remember, Randy, if it was for y'all or somebody who talked about how I look at hydrogen. Uh, rate of change, especially daily rate of change, is, is a big thing with me. Uh, and so I, I feel like it lets me know that I have an active event, whereas that total PPM uh, you know, it's kind of hard to set a guideline there. Uh, you have your IEEE standards, which, which are great to go by, but then you'll see some transformers that maybe condition one, condition two is, is completely normal for their operation. So that hundred parts per million is a, you know, that's, that's not abnormal for that piece of equipment. What I don't want to see is a, a 50 part per million jump over a 24 hour period. Uh, cause obviously that's that's active event so this design also allowed me to do another one other thing that was kind of kind of a neat byproduct of the whole thought process um i was able to look at pressure across everything since i'm putting these adapters in now i can i can actually set a pressure alarm that's going to indicate a leak anywhere on this transformer so much like your substation transformer you know I could set a, a high alarm at seven PSI. I could set a low alarm at a quarter PSI. Um, since the compartments now have headspace that they're tied together in common through the monitor, any, first of all, the cable compartment does become pressurized and any leak that occurs, I see it pretty quickly. Uh, also, it did allow pressure to kind of uh, equalize out between the compartments. As I was telling you, the, the, the cable compartment, it, and switch compartments, really, you would see these really wide uh, variations of pressure uh, just due to ambient temperature, whereas the main tank's considerably larger. Um, so now that I have this, this common gas space we're sharing, uh, during cold periods, some of that pressure can come out, some of that gas can get out of the main tank, migrate into the switch or cable, and vice versa for hot periods. Uh, so kind of equalize out. So we've taken a lot of stress off our gaskets as well. Um, so there's a small pump. It does circulate all this. And one of the nice things I found when I was testing this theory was, uh, well, how effective is looking at, at hydrogen in the gas phase? Because uh, that wasn't something I'd seen done a lot. Again, with the TCG test, I was very familiar with, with that type of testing. However, just a single hydrogen monitor placed in the head space, what's that look like? So, so I did some testing on that. Um, Taking, taking small tanks, seven gallons, uh, three of them, hooking them up through a monitor, uh, filling them with mineral, about five gallons of mineral, sparging a hydrogen 
nitrogen mix through that gas and seeing how does my headspace readings compare to my NO readings. Um, so I, I did this for several weeks. I also did some arcing and all that. I looked at this as well. So generally, like if I if if I'm sparging a thousand parts of hydrogen uh, through and a nitrogen through and all uh, that headspace, I would generally see a pretty good equalization about an hour. So um, Oswald's coefficient, it's a little different. So a thousand would look like a thousand in headspace. However, dissolved in oil, that would only look like 50 uh, parts for me. And if, if that's what you're sparging, uh, it's generally a, a 20 to one ratio, depending on temperature and pressure. Um, but I would generally see that total equilibrium of that gas reaching the headspace about an hour. I've had it take days before I would see it in the in the oil reach equilibrium. Uh, there was a considerable uh, considerable period of time passed before that matched what I was sparging in. Uh, generally, it would equalize out eventually, um, but when you're doing monitoring, especially when you're trying to catch uh, an event, a failure event like this, that response time is is critical. Uh, it also allowed since you have some some variation of hydrogen levels due to, you know, as oil gets hotter, it becomes more, uh, uh, hydrogen migrates more to the oil as it, as it cools down more in gas. So you'll, you'll expect some of that during a day. Uh, but, but again, try to set those, those daily rate of change outside of those limits. And uh, since you have a much faster response from the sensor, it really allows for a quicker detection that you've had these changes. Um, again, with transformers, hydrogen monitoring, and, and by all means, I, I'm, it 100% works in drain valve. I'm not saying that, I'm saying it's slower. And if the fault's occurring on the other side of the transformer, it could be a considerable amount of time uh, before you see it, depending on circulation rates of that oil uh, and how quickly that, that hydrogen reaches some type of equilibrium. If you have leaks on your tank, uh, that process is even worse uh, as it does es escape to atmosphere rather quickly. So this is the unit service, a uh, bit stretched out picture, I apologize for that. Uh, but you can see this is the adapter in here, uh, adapter to the cable. There's another one going around here on the main tank. Uh, so that's kind of the general idea. Again, we're using, uh, ports are already available. So we're not really altering the transformer. Uh, about an hour to install one of these is generally what it takes me. Um, so why monitor the headspace? Uh, so again, with the thought, press, the thought process of this type of monitor, I thought, well, you know, what are our benefits? What are, what, what are the negatives of doing it this way? Um, so First of all, PD is was my main thing I was looking for as as cable failure was what I was seeing a lot of. Um, however, PD monitoring is rather costly uh, for this equipment range, and I was never going to get a budget for that. Um, so hydrogen, of course, is my next best thing. And hydrogen also has the benefit of being generated through every type of thermal condition. So if you have PD, you're going to have a major a majority hydrogen. Uh, if we have a arcing type situation, if it's a sealed unit, we should have about two parts of hydrogen to every part of acetylene produced during that vent. And of course, you have your methanes and ethanes as well. Um, but hydrogen and also the least soluble of all these gases that we typically look at during a uh, during a DGA sample, which means it it migrates rather quickly out of that oil and into a gas phase, uh, and it likes to be in the gas. So we have a much higher concentration in the gas compared to what we would see in oil. And again, that that kind of goes to about a twenty to one ratio depending on temperature. Um, also. When you're looking at it in gas, one of the other advantages is that we have a very fast migration of gas. So when you think of oil, looking at hydrogen oil, that's really not a homogenous uh, distribution of the gas in the oil. As you're circulating, you may get higher readings at one time, lower readings. So, so predictability is a bit off with it. When it hits that gas phase, uh, it's pretty, it, you, you pretty much got an equilibrium across that gas phase at that point, uh, you know, so, so, it, so it spreads out rather quickly, uh, which again is really helping us detect things sooner and un better understand uh, any trending we're doing of the gas. Uh, 
Um, so this actually came from another company, but I, I just like to put this because it was something they did that kind of uh, verified what I had seen in my my own playing around with this. So if we look at the chart in the middle, uh, we're looking at 15 hydrogen sensors installed in the gas face, 5% uh, hydrogen and nitrogen base at 90 degrees C. So pretty high solubility for the hydrogen at that temperature. Um, and you see that they reached max absorption uh, about an hour's time. So about, about what I was saying. Uh, and then you see where they did the sensors in oil uh, for comparison when they ran this experiment, that same experiment. And you can see we're up over 50 hours before we really reach equ equilibrium uh, and a little odder dispersion of the gas. I mean, so it's not as consistent as we, what we would see with the other one. So this is that same test they did, and they actually did a transformer in the field. And it's kind of showed this, uh, you know, when comparing uh, field data to monitor, uh, so the green triangles being our field data, uh, we see that we're kind of all over the place compared to what our monitor is actually reading. Again, this is You've got your how it's distributed in the oil. Uh, also, another thing that really has to come into, to, especially when looking at hydrogen from manual sampling, uh, how are these samples taken? Um, I, I, I've seen I've seen a lot of bad sampling in my life, uh, and, and may have been guilty of it when I was in a hurry at some point or another. So you know that flush process. Uh, how did you pull that sample? Uh, did you store it away or did you let it sit around in the truck for three weeks before you shipped it in? All of this matters. Uh, so, you know, if you think, uh, I, I've always found it kind of funny that, that, that a lot of companies, uh, including me, uh, choose to verify their monitoring with a manual sample when, uh, I've seen a lot more variance from manual samples than I've ever seen from monitoring uh, to the point I, I had some crews. I could tell you which truck pulled that sample just by how far it was away from the norm. Uh, so, I mean, sampling process is something really important to pay attention to. Uh, get your guys trained up. Uh, are you seeing big variations in total dissolved gas? Are you seeing big variations in oxygen and nitrogen content for each of these samples? I mean, some, some things to look at. So when we look at the gas uh, data for the same transformer over the same period of time, uh, we see that the manual samples of it, and again, they're sampling gas now and comparing it to uh, what the monitor is saying, we're seeing a, 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 much, a much more accurate trend. Uh, along with our monitoring. So I think just probably a lot of this can be attributed to, dis to the, the distribution of the gas in oil versus the hydrogen in gas phase. So we talked about hydrogen and, and, and again, even getting away from the, from the network transformer thing, I think it's, it's probably one of the best things you can do uh, as far as if you want to understand is something going on with my transformer short of throwing a multi-gas on it. Uh, so, you know, not every transformer, not every piece of equipment is going to, when you start explaining to budget people that, that I need monitoring for this, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a tough sell at times. However, hydrogen is fairly inexpensive. Uh, it by no means can it take the place of a manual sample program because you do need these carbon gases. You need to understand these other uh, combustible gases where they're at. But as I said earlier, when you have these sudden rates of change during the day, uh, it can tip you off to, hey, something's different. And, and that, that's really what we're looking for. I mean, when we do this is, is something changed from, from normal for this piece of equipment. Uh, so that rate of change alarm is a great way to go with that. So once we get those alarms, what do we do? Typically, we're going to go pull an oil sample. Um, so I thought we would just talk about really quickly, uh, and this is some older data. Again, probably need to refresh this a bit, but uh, hasn't changed. Uh, so talk about really, really quickly, what's an arc look like in oil? What's PD look like in oil? Um, you know, what does 
what is an event that's affecting a lot of paper? So something in a winding effect versus something that's only affecting a connection, that type of thing. So generally with our arcing, we're looking at hydrogen and acetylene, uh, generally about a two to one value. Now, anybody that's done DJI on LTCs know that uh, this can matters a great deal on how well that's sealed. So if you have a free breathing L LTC where we know for a fact that we have active arcing going on, um, probably see a very low hydrogen level on those samples, uh, unless you catch it just immediately after a change. Uh, that, th that again, does a test to that hydrogen, hydrogen monitoring so quickly out of the oil. So if we were seeing a perfect arc in a perfect sealed tank, this is very much the signature I'd expect to see. Uh, if you're doing this for LTC, this would be a sealed LTC that's not a vacuum. This would be what I would be looking for. Uh, if I started seeing those C2H4, my ethylene values start to climb where they're getting higher than my acetylene values. And this, this would be kind of for the LTC rating. Um, you know, that's what I don't want to see in those. Uh, and, and it kind of takes hydrogen out of the mix for looking at LTC as free breathing, a free breathing LCC. I would be looking for that acetylene, ethylene to be maybe 10, 20, 30% of my, my acetylene values. And if I start to see any of this methane, ethane, ethylene starting to grow up uh, where I'm getting more of that present in my LTC sample than I'm seeing of acetylene, uh, most likely I've got contact issues at that point, especially when we start seeing greater amounts of ethylene. Uh, so generally that happens around 350, 400 degrees C, and we're going to start coking contacts at that point. So just a quick talk through what this arcing signature looks like. So if we see this in a main tank, it's terrible. We need to get in and look. However, it's not always the end of the story for LTCs. Again, the hydrogen value depends greatly on, is it free breathing? Uh, is it not? If it is not free breathing, we expect this free breathing. I would expect this to be very low, ethylene and acetylene to be very comparable. Uh, if it's a vacuum LTC and you're seeing any of this, uh, probably want to be of great concern. You've had a vacuum bottle fail uh, outside of a few brands where you'll see some low level acetylene generated from switches. Um, so this was a couple of failures I had in service uh, for when I, when I worked at the utility. Um, so the one on the left is 36 MBA, uh, 161, 23 uh, distribution transformer. And the one on the right was actually to a neighboring utility to the north of me uh, that he called me up one night and said, hey, I've had a transformer failure. Can you look at this and tell me what you think? So looking at these, I kind of laid them out in percentage to show how uh, definitely, definitely an arc in both these tanks. Uh, the ethylene's a bit higher than I would expect to see with a bare metal arc, but for when I'm seeing winding failures, anything you know, that involves quite a bit of paper. I, I kind of have seen this more than not seen it. Um, but that being said, one of these failed, one of them did not. And the DGA tips it off if you're paying attention as to where that failure occurred or do I need to dig into this deeper? So what did we get? So mine, I had a failure, uh, complete failure of a winding. However, when we got to looking at his, I looked at the DGI, I said, this doesn't really look like a winding failure to me. Uh, and again, they rolled out a, a, a double test set. They, they tried to do a power factor test. Uh, test set tripped out, couldn't, couldn't get any current on it. Um, one of the primary leads had, had arced across to some of the, the bracing in the transformer and, and it burnt in half. So from the top of all, looking at the DGI, if you're just looking at arcing and acetylene, so yeah, probably had a failure. Uh, we can't TTR this. We can't power factor test this. And again, this wasn't that easy to see from the top. Uh, all you see is uh, kind of a burnt or, you know, burnt smelling oil is, is what you get when you open this up. So what, what was the difference? Why would I say one was a lot different than the other? So I did a, I did a lot of, uh, a lot of studying past failures I had uh, when I moved into that role at the utility and I kind of looking for started looking for commonalities in these DGAs 
And what am I seeing with the failures that's different from, uh, say, a gassing event where I didn't have a failure, something that we repaired? And that's what kind of led me down this road. So I started looking at CO2 to, to carbon. So carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. Um, and I, actually, I did that backwards. <laughs> There's some, there's some work done by some other companies in this, uh, but what I'm looking for, if I divide CO into CO2, uh, generally I look for increasing ratios in nitrogen sealed transformers. Um, so with nitrogen sealed, they typically go up continually over time. Uh, when you start seeing decrease, uh, generally that's, that's paper degradation of some sort. So when you see a huge drop, which is when the transformer failure, uh, when I looked at that ratio prior to that event, it's about 120 parts of carbon dioxide to every one part of carbon monoxide present. Uh, when I looked at the post event, so after the arc and the trip out, uh, that ratio had dropped maybe two to one. Uh, and again, not really in, it, it was really odd in that it was an increase in carbon monoxide, but not to the extent you would think. Uh, so the increase of carbon monoxide uh, wasn't the total reason for the drop. It seemed like there was a, also a decrease in carbon dioxide in that sample that accompanied that. So something to keep in mind. And so total gas levels, probably relatively the same. So the one that did not fail, the lead failure, what did we see? We went from seven to one to five to one. So a very, very small, small drop in these, these ratios between carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, uh, which like I said from failures I'd seen in the past that generally indicated that you had had something fail that did not involve a lot of the solid insulation, paper insulation. Uh, so what's the difference in these? Generally the one on the right, that's something we can fix. Uh, so I've got a few examples of this. Let's see, I think I do. Yeah. So we'll go. So this was an online monitor measurement we looked at. Uh, and we had an event and a transformer. And I, I just always like this chart because it really kind of showed everything, um, everything I had suspected up to that point to see it actually in real time occur. So when we look at the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, we can see we're, we're humming along pretty good. And then all of a sudden we see an event. And during this event, we saw a big increase in our combustible gases go up. Uh, and we see that this is also starting to drop severely. So again, when I, when I talk about this, I'm thinking solid insulation, paper insulation. So the other big clue off to that was when we look at water content in parts per million in the oil. Uh, as you know, when, whenever paper gets hotter, uh, transformers get hotter, Moisture is pulled out of the paper and, and, and into the oil, and we see that very much occurring here with this event. So it kind of lines up really well for everything I was suspecting. Uh, I see the gassing start. I see the ratio start to drop. So I suspect that, okay, I've had quite a bit of my solid insulation being involved in this, and then the moisture content verifies that for me as I see that a great deal of moisture has been pushed into the oil. So just a nice, nice event to look at. Um, so I know you can't look at all this. This is a transformer I had. Uh, as you see, we, we had a lot of samples uh, over a lot of years. Uh, we had tested good for a while. Um, and then we saw back in 2001, uh, which for those of you that aren't paying attention, that's over 20 years ago, which still kind of freaks me out. Uh, seems like this wouldn't be that old a transformer now. So oh, somebody was having that conversation the other day. But we see back then, we started, we got about two parts of acetylene, and that stayed pretty consistent over a couple of years. Uh, what was more concerning was the ethylene value. So ethylene actually climbed up well over 500 parts per million for multiple samples. Um, we also see some methane production to support that, some hydrogen change. So yeah, definitely an active event. What I didn't see in this event was that sharp drop in the ratio. So when you look at that, that ratio over that same period of time, while all this gassing is occurring, 
we still have a increase in that ratio. So if you trend it out again, not, not a perfect linear, but it's definitely not dropping year to year or sample to sample. We're seeing an increase, which as I said previously, increases generally indicate to me that, okay, paper's probably not involved in this to a great extent. We went in, looked several times, never could find the problem. Uh, power factor, TTR, SFRA, all these tests are saying, hey, everything's fine. Uh, finally got in there and really got in and crawled around. And we found one of the primary connections uh, internally was actually overheating. So again, we have a metal on metal connection, uh, not a lot of cellulose insulation involved in that. And this data all kind of supports that theory as well. We fixed that back in, I, I want to say we, we 2014, I think we fixed it. I'm sorry, I'm getting old, and I have gotten out of my presentation here. Hold on. So, yeah, I, I, I want to say it was 2014, somewhere around there, where we actually made this repair. Yeah, because you can see we were still going up with ethylene pretty good after this internal. Uh, so these changes in gas, I mean, you see it's 575, drops to 27. Uh, that was we opened up. You'll see that over several times where it's internal inspections. We finally found it around 2014. Uh, we made that repair. This transformer is still in service today. So we'd had a uh, uh, looking at the DGA that way. It, it, it proved to be very useful over over a lot of my career at the utility. Okay, and okay. Randy, that's what I have for you. Thank you, every so much, everyone, for listening. Thank you very much. Um, I, let's take a few quick questions here. Yeah, sure. W one, do only older transformers require monitoring or should new transformers also require it? Um, Randy, I'm trying to think how to answer this without putting myself in trouble. So, <laughs> well, then so, don't answer it. <laughs> no, no, I can answer that. So, so, so there's a lot, a of, lot of times people want to know, you know, yeah, like yeah. what do so, what 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 age of transformer d needs online monitoring as opposed to periodic, you know, manual sampling. And and I'm, so so I'm going to answer this, and and uh, so I I do work at Dynamic Range. We do not sell gas monitoring. It's not something we do. So. Uh, we do work with all the gas monitoring companies. Uh, so I, I, th I think there's incidents for, for both. Uh, with new transformers, you do have some, some infancy failures. Uh, so if you look at that bathtub curve, it's very much what transformer failures look like. Do you need to go full on multi-gas with every new transformer? I, I, I don't think so. I think a... Key gas monitoring is a great indicator, especially when we're talking about these infancy failures, things like that. We will see this. Now, this has to be in conjunction with, with a, a pretty robust sampling. You know, you're, you're taking that DGA twice a year. Uh, you know, your offline testing is adequate. Uh, I, I think you can get away with that. Uh, most transformer failures I've seen have happened. As I showed you, they happen over over years, you know, over several years, uh, it's generally not a sudden thing. Uh, however, sudden events do happen occasionally, uh, in which case I feel key gas is great for catching that. Uh, now we have to talk about criticality. Uh, so is this, is a transformer going to be heavily loaded or is it going to see a lot of cyclic loading? And when I say that, I'm talking about you know, we're loading it heavy, we're dropping load levels. So think gener generation, that type of thing. Uh, anything like that, I think a key gas, uh, a multi gas is absolutely uh, necessary. Uh, you know, you just see a lot more failure occurring during that. Uh, we're, we're energizing, we're de energizing, or we're loading, we're unloading. It's during those shifts, you know, you, you have some, some radial and axial movement every time you do that to some degree. Uh, so something that's a little weak tends to fail. Uh, so I, I think it's really important on those kind of units where you're running a unit in that type of situation that you multi-gas is, is probably your best bet. So that would, that would be my best advice I could come up with for Andy without getting in too much trouble. That's kind of how I did it when I was at the utility. Okay, one other question we had was, where does this monitoring happen? Locally, remotely, via SCADA, or in the cloud? Uh, it, it can be any. 
uh, all, all the above are correct. Um, so there's always a local, and, and not just our monitoring, but it, but most monitoring. I mean, there's a local 232 port, some way, maybe a, a, a user interface that you can go through. Um, I know with us, we do a, a general scheme I like to run is to bring some SCADA points out. Uh, it's depending on how the utility is looking at it. So I can bring out everything in a log file over SCADA, at which point you can put that into a PI system, uh, do trending like you want to. Uh, you'll get every minute you get a sample. Um, we can do Ethernet out, uh, and you can also dial into the monitor over, you know, be, be a IP. Uh, our monitors do have built-in web pages, so there's not going to be like a secondary software you have to install. Uh, and when you get into the web page, that really lets you do some graphing, a lot of analytics uh, that are that are already in place there that you can go over. So generally, the the, the best route I've found for a lot of customers, uh, you bring your alarms out over SCADA. And so, you know, like that rate of change we were talking about, yeah, you'd want that hydrogen alarm to come in, at which point, uh, if you did have some type of multi-gas out there, uh, you could go in and figure out exactly what happened. Because like I said, hydrogen alarm, that could be PD, could be overheated, it could could be a lot of things that cause that alarm. Until I see the rest of that gassing pattern, uh, I really don't have a clue as to what's going on uh, without seeing the rest of the DGA. But it would be nice to have, you know, coming into your operations to at least know, hey, I've had this alarm, at which point you could have some type of subject matter expert go in and further analyze what's going on. And that could be over fiber. And we do Modbus DMP 61850, however you want to talk to it. Uh, we also do some cloud and do some cloud hosting for some of our customers where we're, we actually are the SME for them. Uh, we will analyze the data ourselves and tell, give them, advise them on what action needs to be taken. Okay. Great. Okay. Good answer. Uh, and 